Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this first lesson in week number seven. Over the next few lessons, we're going to be studying organic molecules. And this is a very important section, not only because it is really important in science and chemistry, but also because it actually makes up a really big part of your paper too. So please pay attention over the next few weeks. In this lesson, we're going to just introduce organic chemistry to you and introduce the main component of organic chemistry, which is the carbon atom. What comes to mind when you hear the term organic? Do you imagine vegetables and fruit, plants, human bodies, animals, coal, wood? What about things like paint, plastic? The fuel in our buses and cars, perfume, paper, bread, and other foodstuffs like pasta, cheese, vinegar, margarine, and sugar. Yes, you'd be right. All these things and many more are organic compounds. This pen, my clothes, this desk, and virtually all the things on it. Remember that organic chemistry is the study of molecules containing carbon. An organic compound is one that contains carbon. The richest source of organic molecules is living things. A good example is DNA, a molecule inside your cells that uses the special bonding patterns of carbon and other atoms to store the information used to make up your body. In this way, carbon can store the building plan to make your hair dark or your toes short. All life as we know it would be impossible without carbon. In the past, the word organic referred to something from a living thing. Now we know that many manufactured substances are also organic. So all these things have some common characteristics. They all contain carbon and make use of the special bonding properties of carbon atoms. In this series of lessons about organic molecules, we'll look at how carbon makes chemical bonds, making it capable of forming so many different molecules. We'll see how carbon and hydrogen form the backbone of larger molecules and how the size and shape of the molecules can affect physical properties like boiling and melting points. First of all, before we take a look at how carbon atoms bond, let's see why we are so interested in carbon. We find carbon in the middle of the second period on the periodic table. It is in group four, and this means that carbon has four valence electrons. This also means that for carbon to have a complete set of eight electrons, it must make four electron pairs or bonds. These bonds are with other atoms or even other carbon atoms. This is the reason why organic molecules bond and behave the way they do. Let's look at the characteristics of organic molecules first. You already know that each carbon atom can form four bonds. Carbon can bond with itself to form long chains and rings. Carbon can also make double or triple bonds with itself. And it can form ring shapes. Now let's just confirm what we learnt in the last video. Okay, why is carbon important? As they pointed out in the video, carbon is in group four. So it's in period two, group four. And what that means is that it has got four valence electrons, four valence electrons, which means it can go either way. It can either lose four electrons, okay? It can either lose four electrons or it can gain four electrons to complete its outer shell. So that means it can bond with most of the things on the periodic table. Carbon does not only bond with most other elements on the periodic table, it can also bond with itself to form long chains, rings, and spheres. And this is called catenation. And guys, you really need to know this definition of catenation, is that is the fact that carbon can bond with itself 
because they like to ask it, okay? So on the left-hand side here, we've got what is called formerly a Buckminster Fullerene, okay? It is commonly called a buckyball, and what it is and why it's so interesting is that before we only used to know about carbon and bonding together with itself to form graphite or diamond, and everybody used to say there were these two forms of carbon bond bonding with itself. Then they discovered this buckyball, which is after Mr. Buckminster, the Buckminster fullerene. I mean, it's this the whole thing's called a Buckminster fullerene. And it you can see is a total sphere made just of carbons. And over here is a similar type of thing. They've taken the sphere and they managed to stretch it out and this is called a nanotube. And the nanotube, nano, stands for 10 to the minus 9. So that's how tiny this tube is, 10 to the minus 9. And it is used quite often to basically transport medication to very specific sites in the body. So it's used a lot in medicine. So because carbon has got four valence electrons and can bond with itself, and other atoms, it can bond with either single, double, or triple bonds. So yeah, you can see we've got the ball and stick model, and yeah, we've just got the spheres that interchange. Both of these are representing the same thing. And this black atom in the middle here is the carbon, and in this case, we happen to be having four hydrogens. So you can see it's forming a shape. It doesn't have a perfect, when we draw it, we tend to draw it looking like that in one dimension. So there's the carbon and there are its four arms, okay, with a hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. But you can see that three-dimensionally, it actually doesn't form a perfect square or rectangle, and that's because, we'll talk about it later, but it's to do with the repulsion of the electrons shared in this um, structure. And then there you can see what it actually is more specifically what it really looks like, where these actually are, this is a hydrogen and there's actually an overlap of the spheres, and obviously we can't draw it, which is why they're just doing this. So that's actually more like what the molecule looks like. Yeah, you can see that there's a double bond that's being shared, and then the carbons form a more angular shape, okay, with the hydrogens on the end. And yeah, you can see, yeah, you've got, this is a carbon atom that is, oopsie, that is being, shared with a hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom and with another carbon atom. And you can actually see, if you look carefully, that this here is quite a deep bond. And the reason for that is because this is a double bond. And then thirdly, we've got carbon that is forming a triple bond with another carbon. So again, yeah, is your ball and stick with your triple bond, and it's only got space for one hydrogen at the end. And yeah, you've got the spheres that are just showing you how you do it, okay? And finally, this final model here sees a bunch of carbons joined singly to each other, okay? That's their single bonds. They've got hydrogens on their ends with it got spare valence electrons and here it's forming a double bond and I'm assuming that this would be oxygen because oxygen does have two valence electrons that it's happy to share with. So therefore this would be a double bond with oxygen. Okay, so carbon can bond with itself and other atoms to either form single, double or triple bonds. Finally, carbon has electronegativity of 2.5. Okay, yes, yeah, carbon here, yeah, and it's got electronegativity of 2.5. If we look on this table, you can see that fluorine here yeah, has an electronegativity of 4. So if we go 4 minus 2.5, we get 1.5, which is obviously then polar covalent. Okay, and if we go the other way, the smallest number is either francium or cesium, which is at 0 0.7. So if we go 2,5 minus 0 0,7, we again get, what do we get? We get 1,8, which is also polar covalent. So you can see that if carbon is going to bond, it is going to bond basically covalently Okay, and the worst case scenario, it'll be a polar covalent bond. So, the four things that we've spoken about, the fact that carbon has got four valence electrons, that it can bond with itself and with most things on the periodic table, that it can form single, double, and triple bonds, and the fact that 
because of its electronegativity, it can bond and make covalent or polar covalent bonds with most of the elements on the periodic table. All these things are the reasons people think that carbon is the basis of organic life forms. Okay, in other words, why wasn't it silicon or germanium or tin or lead? Well, because they think or the reason that carbon is the basis of organic life on Earth is because of these four reasons. So please, guys, you need to know them. Have a great day.